Welcome to Models, Games, Dioramas, and Things. What can you imagine today? Models, Games, Dioramas, and Things is a place where we show techniques and alternatives that are utilized for detailing models, dioramas, vignettes, game terrain, and more. We share practical and alternative solutions for makers and artists. Come join us in the journey. What can you imagine today? If you're new to this channel, welcome. We hope you enjoy what you see and get a little information to help you on your journey. Like, comment, subscribe, and share. Thank you. There are no promotions, sponsorships, or compensation associated with any product, brand, or seller that I may display, demonstrate, or mention in this video. With that out of the way, let's get to it. In the first video of this series, the basin elevation levels were cut out of foam core and glued into place. Colored base coat formulation was applied with reinforcing fabric interfacing. If you have not seen that video, now is a good time to go back and check it out. You can see pools with steam rising from the hot water. The surrounding areas of pools are variations of yellow, light brown, reds, and almost a rust color. Bacteria causes the colors that are seen. Trees can be seen along with a variety of grass tufts scattered all around the area in the distance. Water from the various geysers spills down the hills into the Firehole River. Around the pools are a variety of textures, stones, and gravel with different deposits. From the earlier video, we allowed fabric interfacing to reinforce the layers and to dry overnight. In this video, We'll show the materials and techniques used to depict colors and shapes of the items found around Old Faithful, specifically the pools and water flows surrounding the geysers. Uh-oh, my camera wasn't turned on. The part that you missed was the demonstration making the paper pulp and adding joint compound and plaster of Paris in certain ratios. This is called plaster mache. For added strength, one could add PVA. In this case, it was not. This was mixed in a small silicone mixing bowl. Once the plaster mache is prepared, it can be added to the terrain and smoothed out. Sculpt a mold from Woodland Scenics or sculpt it from Sargent Art are great products. Either of these are highly recommended. If you make large terrains or many base terrains, a DIY plaster mache could be a cost-effective way to achieve a similar result as the branded products. In the alternative, one could buy the branded products in bulk. Many makers and crafters make their own plaster mache using toilet paper pulp and plaster. A DIY plaster mache is used in this project, a type of cellulose insulation that is blown into houses and other structures is used. It's made from recycled paper with additives to make it fire and vermin retardant. These additives to the cellulose insulation do not seem to affect the result in dioramas. The cellulose insulation is sold in big box stores in bulk. If one should go this route, one package should last a long time, possibly a lifetime. If one does not have a place to store such a bulk item, they may use shredded documents and newspapers. The shredded paper can be processed further in a blender with water to a fine pulp. Here, you can see the texture of the cellulose insulation right out of the package. The insulation was processed in a small blender in amounts needed 
for the project at hand. It is blended down with water to a very fine pulp. Do not let the pulp dry out, but go right into using it for the project. The consistency can be fine-tuned. It can be specially blended for specific uses and projects. Once the pulp has been blended super fine, begin adding plaster and joint compounds to the mix. Use dry joint compound, in this case a 90-minute set, in equal parts with plaster of Paris. There seems to be little difference if you use volumetric measurements, say a cup or so, or by weight, by the gram or ounce. With these proportions, one gets the best of both worlds. With the plaster of Paris, you'll get a very hard surface. With the joint compound mixed in, the plaster can be smoothed out. These are mixed dry and then added to the watered down paper pulp. It can be mixed to a variety of consistencies from a slurry to a thick paste depending on the need. This mixture is usually colored with a colored base coat formulation. If the color is too dark, one can add acrylic white paint or ink to get the desired effect. After this mixture is applied to the surface, dust it with unsanded grout. This grout absorbs any surface water that may collect. Keep adding unsanded grout until the surface water no longer pools. Use a chip brush to apply the plaster mache to the diorama. Smooth out the layers into the foam core. Spray the surface with a 25% mix of IPA and then add your sanded grout. It's a good idea to use a fine mesh stocking to even out the plaster and remove any large uh, particles that are in the plaster. Using an artist's knife or a small spatula, smooth out any off-putting textures until the desired result is achieved. After about an hour of drying time, sculpt the terrain until a satisfactory result is effective. For this diorama, use a silicone shaping tool to create gouges that occur during natural weathering and erosion. Add small gravel and sand to the riverbed. Use thin cork sheet and vermiculite to raise the edge of the geyser Old Faithful. For the pools in the area, make small circles of glue and apply vermiculite to resemble the perimeters of these small pools. A clear base coat holds the sand and gravel into place. Firmly fix the sand and gravel into place with an overspray of a 25% dilute IPA. This helps break the surface tension of the base coat or 30% PVA that is then flooded over the area. It might take a couple of days to dry. Prime the areas where specific colors are going to be added to the diorama. In this case, a white primer, so that the colors will be enhanced when applied. After applying the primer, use a blow dryer to speed up the drying. Anytime large surface areas are to be covered, using an airbrush allows for control of where and how much paint is applied to the surface. After priming, continue with painting the undercolors of sand and beige mixed with white in a variety of layers from dark to light. The darker color boosts shadows and shading. For model making, this is generally called pre-shading. When pre-shading this way, do not clean out the airbrush between colors. This improves the blending of colors, removing any stark changes in colors. The area around Old Faithful has some interesting colors around the pools and the hot water springs. This is caused by bacteria. Here, we're replicating the bacteria's colors. Use a small round number one brush for adding detail to the diorama. 
in most instances, this is the smallest brush one might need to use. Detail is applied to the diorama with the number one round pointed artist brush. When one paints details, the paint must flow from the brush to the surface. For this to happen, it needs to be wet. Using a brush smaller than a number one, like say a zero double odd or even a triple odd, there's not enough bristle there to hold paint long enough for it to not dry before painting. While it is said that these smaller brushes are used to paint fine detail, it could be argued that they are entirely too small for most practical painting purposes. This would include miniatures for table gaming. A number one brush is sufficiently small enough to paint the details and large enough to remain wet for a long enough time for the paint to be used. After the details are complete, wash the entire base with a light translucent tan or sand color. This overspray evens out the colors and removes any sharp, unnatural deviations in color. The next area was the riverbed. Here, a bright blue is used to enhance the illusion of depth. Once the blue paint has dried, again, you may use a blow dryer, dry brush the small pebbles with a burnt umber mixed in white to enrich the stone appearance. You can see that at first the brush is still too wet and added far too much color. This will be corrected in later steps. Like Bob Ross used to say, we don't make mistakes, only happy accidents. In nature, where rivers and streams are next to wooded areas, there sometimes happens that a tree would fall across the waterway, thereby damming up the area until the next flooding event. To replicate this, glue a small branch across the riverbed, like seen here. Using an airbrush, paint the undercolors of the water flows down the hillside to the river. Paint in the colors for the pools and around their perimeters. Filling the area pools with clear effects, top the pools with snow effects. Topping the clear with snow effects allows the water to appear as though it is boiling or bubbling up. At least that's the idea intended. It worked out during experimentation. A brief note about experimenting. It's always a good idea to experiment away from the project you're working on. This allows you to see what may happen with the products that you're going to use. In this case, there were two steps to be achieved. The first was to understand how snow effects was going to react with the resin. The second was on how mica powders were going to color the resin. Once it was decided the quantity, it was applied to the model. Rushing water was created again using realistic resin water mixed with snow effects. This resin has a light viscosity, almost like water. Mix the snow effects with the resin until it is a thick paste. Water ripples were created using gloss varnish. The gloss varnish was liberally applied to the surface of the river and then ripples were created by blowing on the wet gloss varnish with an airbrush or straw. In areas where the water shows to be rushing fast, water resin was mixed again with snow effects.
In our next video, we'll show you grasses, tufts, foliage, and trees, and how they are applied.